Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Amy Draves, and I'm pleased to welcome Linda Hill to the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. She will be discussing her book, Collective Genius, in which she interviewed the best in the business to learn how they foster innovation on their teams. She is the Dunham, sorry, Don Ham Professor of Business Administration in the Organizational Behavior Area at Harvard Business School, where she chairs the Leadership Initiative and serves on the faculty of the Leadership Best Practices Program. She has authored Becoming a Manager and co-authored Being the Boss, which the Wall Street Journal named one of the five best business books uh, to read for your career in 2011. In 2013, she was named by Thinkers 50 as one of the top 10 management thinkers in the world. Please join me in giving her a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's quite a pleasure to be here, and it's not only because you have no snow, but I am always happy to be any place that has no snow. We are trying to break records in Boston. And I, I also appreciate the chance to speak, to speak with you about something that truly is an obsession of mine, and that is leadership and innovation. And I will tell you that this is my 30th year being a professor at the Harvard Business School, and frankly, I've been trying to study this question for 30 years, but I only got really, really serious about it about 11 or 12 years ago. And what I want to share with you are some of the findings of a very systematic project we did looking at leadership and innovation. Like many organizations, the academy is quite siloed. And it turns out that there's a ton of research on leadership, and there's a ton of research on innovation. But there's not very much looking at the connection between the two. And that's what I want to speak with you about today. And the bottom line of what we found is that basically what, for many years, I've been trying to help people learn how to do, i.e. lead, the, the models of leadership that we've been actually telling people that they should be adopting actually do not work when it comes to leading innovation. And that is not an easy thing for me to say to you because this is something I've been doing for a number of years. So I want to talk to you about what I do think is a model of thinking about leadership when you want to innovate, when you want to build an organization that can innovate time and again. And that's the question. That's what we mean by an exceptional leader of innovation. And we looked at both middle managers and senior executives and CEOs who were leading either you know, teams, business units, or enterprises. And so I'm going to be talking about people who worked in a range of different industries. And I do want to say that we did do the project around the world. The other area that I do work in is on what does it take to implement a global strategy. And I spend a ton of time in emerging markets. So in fact, the research was meant to be pretty global in its outlook. We obviously haven't covered every country. And we continue to collect data. So the data that I'm going to talk with you about or from is really at that point we had studied 16 exceptional leaders of innovation in depth for this particular project. And the we really is a collaboration. So one individual, Emily, she joined when she was 23. I understand that she's a millennial. I am not. And it's very important to have that point of view. The other two co-authors that I have both are executives, or were executives. Greg was at Pixar. He was asked by Steve Jobs to leave Next and go help scale Pixar. So he's one of my co-authors. And the other is Kent Leinbeck, who worked in more traditional organizations, as he would put it. He just turned 70. So we represent four different different decades. I just want to tell you that this is our collective work, not just mine. I think that's an important piece of the puzzle to talk about. So these are the countries we visited. I'm an anthropologist, so what we have to do is spend time on the ground observing up close and personal these individuals as they do their work. And so that is how we did our research. And then obviously, we have field notes and go back and analyze that. So I just want to tell you what the data are. And in fact, we continue to collect data. And so now we have probably 26 executives that we actually have studied. I'm going to be talking about some number of these 12, just to tell you, though. These are the 12 that are in the book. And they all, as I said, they represent different, um, different levels in the organization. Some, I think, would, you would say live in organizations that are very friendly to innovation. Others do not. And so I don't know if you recognize any of those people. I'll tell you about a few of them. These are some of the organizations they come from. And indeed, when I'm talking about the connection between 
leadership and innovation. If they're not the CEO, I'm not trying to claim that the whole company is innovative. So the person that I actually studied at IBM was the person who headed up mergers and acquisitions for the new business part of IBM. The person at Pfizer is the general counsel of Pfizer. We also have begun to study what I guess we would refer to as ecosystems and what looking at those as well. So Cal IT2 is the hub of an ecosystem in San Diego to do biotech and nanotechnology work. So we've looked at both organizations and these sort of ecosystems as we begin to do this research. And frankly now, mostly we're doing research on the ecosystems and we're looking in three different countries, um, the UAE, Singapore, et cetera, because trying to combine this innovation and globalization piece of the puzzle. So first thing I want to just say is I want to define what, how we ended up defining innovation. And this basically reflects how the leaders that we spoke to defined it. They had a very broad definition of innovation. So they saw innovation as being both incremental and breakthrough. It could be a product, a service, a business model, a process, a way of organizing, very inclusive notions. For sure, innovations are something that are both new and also useful. If it's just new, it's creative. If it's not useful, it's not an innovation. It's just to create something that you've created. So it has to be both new and useful to be defined as an innovation in our work. And so what I want to do first is show you this person. Do many of you recognize this person? Yes. Very interesting. Often when I'm even in Silicon Valley, most people don't recognize this person, which is sort of curious when you know who it is. You do recognize these people. Yes, right? So that person you were looking at is the founder of Pixar. That is Ed Catmull. He also is the person who just turned around over a number of years, Disney Animation. So he knows how to build a company that can innovate, and he knows how to turn around a company. So I think we'd say he's an example of someone who's pretty good at it. I think it's actually very interesting, and we want to come back to the fact that most people don't recognize Ed. And that sort of tells us a little bit about the kind of leadership that might be required when you're leading innovation as well. So again, Pixar, I think, is an organization we'd all say is innovative. And one of the things, it doesn't matter who you talk to, business people, if you talk to artists, if you talk to technologists. And my first visit to Pixar was back in 2004 when they were working on Ratatouille, that lovely you know, movie about a rat becoming a master chef. I must say, when I saw the rat on the little, I thought, what on earth is this particular movie going to be about? And you may recall that it took Pixar 20 years to make the first full-length computer-generated movie. And I think we need to keep in mind how long it really does take to do breakthrough innovation. Since that time, Toy Story 2 came out in 1995. They've actually, their 15th movie is about to come out. And it looks, it looks very good. I was just there a couple of, couple of weeks ago. So they have been able to do this. And one of the things that they for sure know is that innovation is not about some genius having an aha moment. Now, one of the things that they say at Pixar is that filmmaking is a team sport. And I'm just going to build this out. Let's see, I'm going to build it all at once and just talk with you about it. So when we first went to Pixar, someone sort of drew a picture like this so that we'd understand what their process was. And he did it reluctantly because he thought it looked a little bit too neat, even despite all those arrows. So for sure what he said is, you know, Linda, it's a very messy process. It's a very iterative process. But there is a logic to it. And one of the things that you may or may not know is it takes about 250 to 300 people four to five years to make one of these movies. So it's definitely a team sport. It's not about one solo person you know, getting it right immediately. It also is the case that they frequently have had to change directors. So you know, again, it doesn't always work out as well as one would like. Now what happens when you make one of these movies, and many of you may be in parts of the business that you, you really have lived this, is that shots or scenes move through the pipeline, the production pipeline, at different speeds. And they don't move in order, depending on how difficult the particular scene will be. So it turns out, for instance, that the scene, which is not a very difficult scene actually, the scene where the little boy hands a piece of chocolate to a bird and up, I don't know how many of you have seen that movie. That particular scene took one of their top animators six months to perfect. Now, if you look at something like Sully, you know, in Monsters, Inc., for which they won an Academy Award, his hair is like mine. I like to tell this story because <laughs> someone actually got an Academy Award for doing this, OK? And I, I know how hard it is, so that feels good to me. And I must confess, when I first went to Google and met people, they all asked me, did you meet the man that did Sully's hair? How, how did that happen? How, that's really, really difficult. So that's very difficult. It took ages. The shadows under the cars and 
that ray tracing, very, very difficult task as well. So things move through at different speeds. And one of the things they say at Pixar is the whole, nothing is done until the whole movie wraps. And so what that means is that things, again, really do iterate all along the way. And one scene, there was a scene that an animator did, and he drew um, sort of a, an arched eyebrow to a character. And he showed that to the director. And the director saw that and said, you know, well done, but not how I imagined the character, so lose it. So lost it, went away after all that work. A Couple weeks later, the director comes back and says, where are those few seconds? Pulls it out, looks at it, decides to include those scenes or those moments in the film. And what they say at Pixar when that happens is that that individual animator was able to share his slice of genius with the director and as a consequence, help the director have a much more subtle, nuanced sense of that character and therefore improve the story. So the problem you always face when you're trying to innovate, if you want to get the new, you have to figure out how to unleash the ideas of the individual. But if you want to get the useful, you have to figure out how to harness those ideas into a solution that is really you know, going to solve a problem that the group has, a collective problem. So how do you get that unleashing and that harnessing to happen is what we were trying to look at. And so that's what the process, and I'll talk about some paradoxes that are really embedded in that unleashing and harnessing process that really are at the heart of leading innovation. So this process of trying to figure out how to do this, time and time again, is what we wanted to understand. What was it? How did Ed think about what he was doing that led him to create an organization that could do that? And what we ended up realizing as we looked through our data is that no matter what kind of organization we were looking at, whether it was an Islamic bank in Dubai or a luxury brand in Korea, all of these organizations had three capabilities, and they are organizational capabilities. And I want to tell you a little bit about, about each. The first one is the creative abrasion. This capability is about how you actually engage in debate and discourse to create a marketplace of ideas. And what these organizations understand is that you do not get innovation without diversity and conflict. Those are really critical ingredients for any innovation. So what you see in these organizations is that they actually amplify difference. They don't minimize it. Because that difference or those differences are, again, the resource you're going to rely on to figure out an innovative solution to some problem you're trying to solve. So what they do, again, is you might do brainstorming to get some, but in the end, you actually want to have heated debate. And it has to be constructive, and that's not easy. So that creative abrasion is how you begin to unleash those ideas. The second thing you need to do is creative agility. And this is about how you refine that portfolio of ideas that you've come up with and figure out which ones you should pursue. And here, this is very much like what you see with design thinking, some combination of you know, discovery-driven learning where you act your way to an answer, you don't plan your way to an answer. So what you see in these organizations, as one of them told us, is we run experiments, we don't run pilots. If you run a pilot and it doesn't work, then something was wrong or someone failed. There's too much political stuff around it. When you run an experiment, you run it to learn. So if you get you know, an outcome that's not, quote, the right outcome, there's no right outcome. You've learned from it. You take that information, and you, you try again. You experiment again. So the second capability is this creative agility, being able to do those experiments, really pay attention to the feedback, take it seriously, and make the necessary adjustments. And then the final one is creative resolution. And this is about the fact that, as you all know, and I'm sure have experienced, most innovations are not brand new. Right? Very dangerous to say you've discovered something that no one's discovered before, because someone probably has discovered some version of it. Most innovations are actually combinations of old ideas, or old ideas reconfigured to solve new problems. So you have to have a way of doing decision making that will allow you to do both and, as opposed to either, other, either or thinking. So if people's ideas come out, instead of one person having to win, you make decisions in a way that you can combine them. So what you do see in these organizations is that people are not willing to go along to get along. Not in the least. In fact, they will not compromise because that is the easier path. They will also not let one group or individual dominate. So they don't let the people who are higher in the hierarchy dominate, and they don't let the experts dominate. And I will tell you that expert piece is actually one of the more complicated parts of the process. How do you keep, if you will, the experts from dominating when, in fact, you're trying to make a decision about which way to go? So these are three capabilities that we saw in all of these organizations, creative abrasion, creative agility, and then creative resolution. 
And so when you build these capabilities, this is what allows you actually to engage in the innovative process. Now this gentleman, I don't think most of you would recognize either, but you probably on some level know about him. I think he was employee number eight or nine, Bill, to, in, in Google. And he was the senior vice president of engineering at Google. And so built the website and you know that we all, it works pretty well, very rarely goes down 24 seven. He's really good at what he does. And I do remember as a person who's slightly older, uh, I was very happy to see when I went to look at his group you know, everybody wasn't necessarily young and playing volleyball. They either had gray hair or they were bald, and I appreciated that. <laughs> so Google did not play when they tried to figure out who should build their website. They actually went to Bell Labs. He was one of the finest leaders at Bell Labs. He brought over a team, added some people to it to build that website. We looked at them as they were trying to take on Gmail and YouTube. So we like to look at organizations over time. And as you know, better than I do, that the storage demands for YouTube or Gmail is very different than search. And so we were very curious to see how are they going to respond to that. And so for sure I was really curious as a you know, professor, I was very interested to see how they're going to put this team together to come up with what to do about this. Well, Bill did nothing. He sort of didn't choose a team. Instead he said, let's just watch spontaneously and see what comes up. And what came up were two different approaches to how to respond to Gmail and YouTube. One was somewhat more evolutionary, the other more revolutionary. And these two teams just emerged. And so Bill said, you know what, we're gonna let these teams play out their point of view. And he allowed them to work on these, this, their, their models or their solutions, if you will, or potential solutions for two years full time. And as he said, they were working at breakneck speed. Again, to remind us how hard it is actually to do breakthrough kind of work. And what he basically did is allowed two parallel experiments to be run. And the role of the leader in all of that was to make sure they were honest. He said the leader's role is to inject honesty into their process and also to make sure that they debate. And so what they were encouraged to do, again would not surprise you, was to build their prototypes pretty quickly and to test or bump up was the word he used, their prototypes up against different users. The next thing that Google wanted to do the group that would have to get up in the middle of the night if the website you know, went down, et cetera, so that they could discover for themselves the strengths and weaknesses of their particular approach. Now, while this was happening, the engineers were complaining because Google actually had a shortage of engineering talent. And they said, you just need to pick, or you need to get the team that's the best team, and you need to let them go at it. He said, no, leave well enough alone. Just do the discovery process. Eventually, a lot of data sort of coming in about which one's working better or not, as well as the websites getting a little wobbly are gonna be a problem, so they have to make a choice. And this is the moment, he said, that this is really critical when you're a leader, because one solution was going to be selected and one wasn't. And so he did that, but in doing that, he said, this is where social architecture comes in as a leader. You gotta make sure that the group that, quote, loses gets adopted by the new group that is doing the next generation work so you don't lose what they have learned and they feel like they've made a contribution because they truly have. It's not just perception. So the whole process was to get some of the members of quote the losing team to be adopted by the new team that was working on the next big thing. And that happened very seamlessly and when that next big thing came out, those, those people saw their work. So he almost always did things by having these parallel experiments run, making sure you don't lose the learning because frankly, most innovations don't work and you've increased your probability by two things, <laughs> getting an answer that might work when you have two teams working at it. And though many people might view that as very inefficient, in his mind, extremely efficient. Extremely efficient way to actually get done what innovations need to happen. And they pretty much did most of their innovation that way, having these parallel teams running experiments. And his role again was to make sure they, to inject honesty, that they're really paying attention to the feedback they're getting when they test their prototypes and moving it forward. So that was the way, just to illustrate the process they went through. You could see the kind of the creative abrasion that happened there, a little bit of the, a lot of the agility. And then the resolution, when you combine these things, different combinations get used in different generations along the way. So what this person told us, one of the engineers who was most, uh, most adamant that uh, you know, Bill was wasting, wasting time and energy here by doing things this way. He said when, he, when, he, when they finished this process, he said, you know what I've learned is, I think Bill's right. First off, you need to keep these teams at a sort of a human scale. And if he had made those two teams become one team, they would not have focused on what's the best, 
what's the right answer, if you will, or the better answer, they would have been trying to prove who was the winner and who was the loser. They would not have been able to work constructively because they were so passionate about their particular approach. So for him, going back to, yes, you need diversity and conflict, some conflict is going to be healthy. Others, people aren't going to be able to see it, not at that point anyway, and better to keep them separate and run the experiments and make sure you don't lose the learning. So what we actually did see about these leaders, and Bill was one of the ones who told us this. Bill said to us, he said, you know, I, I'm, and he, I don't really read books on leadership. Because when I read books on leadership, they actually sort of just depress me. Because in the, on the first page, it says, you're supposed to have a vision or an answer. He said, the only reason I took this job at Google is I had no vision. I had no answer. That's what gets me up every morning. So, I guess I don't lead. These books aren't relevant. And Linda, isn't it the case if you're trying to do something that's cutting edge and breakthrough, you have no vision? I mean, what, how does this work? So we had about four leaders sort of say to us, this doesn't work so well when I think about, when I read about leadership, because that doesn't fit what I do. So I was saying to Amy, I ended up having to write uh, Being the Boss with Kent, because the models of leadership we had were not fitting what we were discovering as we were collecting the data for this research. And so what these individuals did, or how they thought about what leadership was about, is they did not see themselves, let me just skip through these pieces, don't think we, they did not see themselves as being the visionary who created a vision, communicated that vision, and inspired others to want to fulfill that vision. That's not how they saw their role. I will tell you that every person we studied was a visionary. They definitely were visionaries, and it may be to be credible, in some of the worlds they lived in, if you're not a visionary yourself, people don't want to play with you. So I don't know the answer to that. It's partly because of the way we, so we, we selected these individuals. Having said that, I also want to say there is very much a place for visionary leadership. That, that it really is about leading change, but it is not about leading innovation. Because if you are trying to get people to innovate, what you really need to focus on is how do you create a context in which people will be willing and able to innovate. Because innovation is a journey. It's a collaborative kind of problem solving that indeed involves this discovery-driven learning with lots of missteps, lots of even failures. And the other part of it is these combination of ideas. And the final thing that we have to remember about innovation is it's very exhilarating work to do, but it's also um, very, can be very demanding, debilitating, and emotionally complicated work to do. It's intellectually complicated, and it's emotionally complicated. So I want to tell you one story about Greg, my co-author co -author from Pixar. Uh, Greg, he, we did put this in the book. He, he said, I can't believe we're going to put this in the book. But anyway, we did, because it's so central to, to what actually happened, the history of Pixar, and also to understanding the story. So Greg was the head of systems at Pixar. And you all have read about Steve Jobs, of course. And obviously, he's pretty good at what he does if Steve asked him to go over and take on that role at Pixar. Well, they had four or five, depending on how you want to count it, redundant systems for making sure they didn't lose a movie. Another storage problem. I didn't realize storage was so hard until I got into this. And now I know how hard storage is. But anyway, they lost Toy Story 2. So, to Toy Story, they lost Toy Story, not Toy Story 2. They had Toy Story 2. They lost Toy Story even though they had these four or five redundant systems. And you know if you lose it, if it's no longer to be found on storage, it does not exist because these movies are numbers, right? So Greg, they look and they cannot find it anywhere because of, quote, a perfect storm. There was a problem that maybe you all heard about at the time, too. We're going back in history a bit. There was a problem that no one realized existed in the way you thought about creating these redundant systems, and they discovered it. So Toy Story, 2 is, Toy, Toy Story is gone. This is not a good thing. He has to go tell Ed that they cannot find Toy Story. So he goes to tell Ed, cannot find Toy Story. It is not here. And it turns out after they did a post-mortem that it was only one human error in the whole process at the very end, the last copy. The, four, the other four just went, even though they were doing the best the way you were supposed to do it, right? Yes, I want you to have nightmares tonight. Anyway, so what, was, uh, what, what happened was he went to Ed and he said, it's gone. Can't find it. So Ed's first comment to him was, this must be a really hard problem if you've lost that movie, because you are really good. I had no idea that we were that far out on the cutting edge. And it is not good. This is not the kind of failure you want. This is bad failure, right? I had no idea we were there. We have to go tell Steve. So they went to tell Steve that they had lost Toy Story. And you can only imagine. And what 
Steve's first words were, this must be a really hard problem if you've lost Toy Story. I had no idea we were out there on the cutting edge like that. That was his first reaction. Now, interestingly enough, before we could hear his second one, they were able to say, but he had the same reaction as Ed. Interesting, just very similar reaction. You, you all are really good. This, how, how do we lose this movie? They were able to say, we found it. And the reason they were able to say they found it was because of the culture of the place, the willingness, and they want to go back to that. So they found it because it turned out there was a woman who was on maternity leave, and she had wanted to still play and do the movie, right? So they paid $90,000 to let her have a computer at home, because that's what it costs to have a computer at her home that would actually be able to deal with you know, a Toy Story, the kind of data you needed. She was on maternity leave and busy with her baby and didn't realize they were looking for the movie. At some point, she actually went to the computer and saw that the movie was there. She said, oh, you're looking for the movie? I have a copy. Now, if you know anything about movies and studios, movies don't leave the grounds, right? Well, at Pixar, everybody sees the movie. Anybody who's there is allowed to see the movie, send comments to the director. They don't all have permission to take it off the grounds. But indeed, she had the movie, so they were able to say to Steve, guess what, but we found it. And as a consequence of that, when you look at the credits of movies, from, the credits are very long at Pixar because they believe that you should be generous with credit, but listed on there, you may not recognize it, are the names of babies born during a movie, and now you know why, okay? Because it, it takes a village, is what they said, to include the babies that are about to be born to make one of those movies really get made. And when they actually gave out the bonuses for that movie, uh, someone had said to Steve Jobs, we should give a bonus to the people that did Toy Story. And he said, no, we should not give a bonus to those people. We need to give a bonus to everybody in the studio, the person who made the hamburgers to the director. They all deserve it. And what everybody got was, I believe, 13 weeks times whatever their salary was. Because again, everybody has a slice of genius. They're not all equal but everybody had a contribution to make, so therefore Steve handed out to everybody 12 or 13 times whatever their salary was because everybody mattered to the making of that movie. So that's the kind of culture that they want to build to make sure people are willing to do this. And embedded in the process of unleashing and harnessing, and I just want to, I'm not going to talk through all of these things and we can come back to it with your questions, but those first two paradoxes have to do with creative abrasion. And one of the things that I do want to just point out about those first two is if you don't provide enough support or psychological safety in the environment, people will not share their ideas, particularly when they're working with other really, really talented people. One of the challenges you have at a place like Pixar or even Google is you have really, really capable people. How do you get the, the new person who's coming in who's just starting to learn how to animate to actually tell a John Lasseter how he actually feels about what's been done. How do you create that creative abrasion unless there's a lot of psychological safety or support? You also need to have the confrontation. The next two are about, these are about agility and these two are about decision making. So in these organizations, decision making is very clear who in the end gets to make the decision, but it's relatively inclusive and patient. So again, what you see is that we allow people to have input, a lot of input. Everybody really knows who's going to make the decisions in the end. But again, and we're going to be patient, and we're going to let you go for two years, if you will, at Google. Eventually, it's going to become urgent. And guess what? Bill's going to step up and say, now we make the decision. It's going to happen, and he's going to do it in a very top-down way, because it, it needs to go on. So again, you're trying to unleash and harness, and you're constantly recalibrating across these as you're trying to think about exercising those capabilities. So I don't want to, these little people move because you realize that Greg is an animator. This is supposed to move more than this. I've taken out most of the movement. Did you see how <laughs> I'm a professor who writes in words. He thinks in pictures. But anyway, those little people, his people move much more than mine, I will tell you. I'm not going to, this is about the community, the, synth, the kind of culture. So the capabilities are the process you need to be able to do. This is the kind of culture you need to build to allow for people to engage in those capabilities. And we called it a community culture because fundamentally people feel like they are a part of a community. They care about the collective. And at the heart of it is some sense of purpose. And if you don't have this sense of purpose, it's very hard for people to be willing to do this work. And why should I bother unless I really care about the purpose? So the person that we studied who makes luxury ba bags in Korea, for instance, um, she wants you to pay a lot of money for them. One of the things that she, 
she talks about, though, is that the reason why she went into the luxury brand business is that Asian women are the market that many, many companies hope to get to buy these goods. And she felt it was really a problem that Asian women weren't in the business because luxury becomes how you define yourself. And she felt it was important to have an Asian woman with, an, with a different sensibility in that business to help as you will, is, you know, as China, et cetera, as that was all happening, that there was a voice of the Asian woman in the process. And when she, that is what her business is about. And actually, she has a very large uh, foundation that's connected to the business as well. But one of the things that's interesting about this purpose is, okay, that's Mrs. Kim. So as I went to ask other people, you know, how did they, and, and Mrs. Kim uh, in Korea, Chairman, Chairperson Kim, as they called her, it's a very different culture. People wouldn't even sit. They stand when she's speaking. And it's, uh, but she had to figure out how to create this kind of culture. So she does a lot of business on airplanes when they have no choice but to sit next to her. That's uh, different ways uh, to break down, break down what goes on here. And I must say, when I interviewed some of the Brits and Italian men who worked for her, et cetera, I said, what do you feel about this purpose stuff? You know, I thought that was nonsense. I just wanted to work with her because she knows how to build brands. But you know what? As I've been in this company for a while, this purpose really does matter. And it really is affecting how I'm, I'm making choices about doing the business. And there's a culture that gets built. I don't think you'd be surprised by these values. All of these organizations have very different cultures. But they all, on some level, have these values. The bold ambition, they all have appetites that are much bigger than their capabilities. So they do not value risk, and they do not value failure. I just want to point that out, because they, when you have bold ambition, you're going to take risks, and you're going to have some failures. But that's not, that's not valued, per se. A very deep sense of responsibility. These are some of the rules about how you're supposed to interact. Um, these are easy words to say, but difficult to live. One of the most interesting ones that here that I just want to mention is that one of the most important roles of a leader they think is to make sure that the minority voice gets heard. And interestingly enough, the other project, as I said, I work on globalization. But one of the other, if you will, leaders that I've sort of been studying was Nelson Mandela, who I did have the privilege of meeting, because you know, he's a social revolutionary, as far as I'm concerned, very much also agrees with these notions of leadership. But one of the things that he talked a whole lot about is making sure that minority voice is heard. And if you look at actually how they even went through their constitution process, very, very um, interesting process that he thought about and what his role as the leader was in helping with that. But this issue of, of trust and respect, even for people who you know, obviously were, quote, your enemy or maybe didn't treat you so well, was one of the things about him as a leader that actually made a huge difference in what they were able to come up with. The other piece that we didn't see right away is there are also rules of, about how you're supposed to think about problems. And this is actually quite important when you have diverse people trying to struggle with something, that we have some rules about how we think, that we're supposed to be very holistic in our approach and we're supposed to be data driven. And what that really means is you may not have data to prove your point of view, but you need to be able to, you have to be able to admit to people that you have no data. It's your gut. You just tell people what's your evidence for what you're believing about X, Y, Z. And those rules actually help it make it much easier for us to get through certain debates that we need to have about things. It also makes sure that when we're looking at the results of experiments, we don't reject those results and say, oh, that was a wrong experiment, et cetera. So there were rules about that. Just uh, then once you do that, you do get that sense of direction. Because I think people worry, well, if you don't have purpose is different than vision. It's not about where we're going. Purpose is about who we are. It's about our, our collective identity, which is a different, different task. Just wanted to tell you, this, this man I met um, when he was at Fiat. He was the CEO of Fiat when they did the rejuvenation of the Fiat 500. He then went to Volkswagen, and he was the chief marketing officer of all nine brands. Very interesting job as well as the uh, marketing officer for the Volkswagen brand. He's now the head of sales and marketing for Audi. So we've studied him in all of those different contexts, again, to see if we see, in the, is it him if that's sort of making the difference? And this is Luca, an Italian who had to learn German very quickly when he went to Volkswagen, because that is the <laughs> official language of Volkswagen. And one of the things he did, he gave the Germans a little bit of a scare. This is in. Uh, and it's marvel. I mean, it, obviously, Volkswagen's quite a fine company. That's Luca standing here. And this is his first meeting of the 153 marketing professionals from around the world. They'd never come together. And he wanted them. You can't teach people or have people think 
their way into being different, you have to force them to act their way into being different. So he used space as a lot of the people we studied to do that. And so this is one of their first sort of strategy meetings. And I'm not, I use PowerPoint all the time, so I'm not being negative, but they were not allowed to bring any presentations to this meeting. And as you'll see, there are no chairs, so this was a little confusing. It's very choreographed, but it's, th these are their laboratories. So instead of, if you will, having sort of strategy meetings per se, they now have laboratories, which would not maybe be so, un so confusing to you. And they do work in a, in a very different way because he wanted them to get comfortable. He wanted to give them positive shocks to behave very differently in how they begin to think about things and in different combinations. And this is one of the ways he used to break down hierarchy and get people to, to engage in different ways. So the other thing in terms of purpose that became very important, you have to go back to the DNA of a company often to figure out what that purpose can be. And at Volkswagen, it really is, if you know, the people's car. So what they have decided their battleground for innovation is really around sustainability. It's this, fundamentally, it's actually Volkswagen's even owned partly by the government. It's very much a, that kind of model. So they ended up, Think Blue is their sustainability model. And his problem as being the head of marketing and sales is that at Volkswagen, it was the engineers who were the creatives or the innovators, not marketing and salespeople. But he said, you cannot have an innovative brand unless marketing and sales are also innovative. Brands are built from the inside out. So part of the dilemma was to show them that they also were innovators, right? Again, why you need to have that broader definition of what innovation is about. This man is a, a fun, very fun person. Um, he was the CEO of something called HCL Technologies. And some of you may know HCL Technologies. You do? All too well. Uh, do, you, uh, do you work with them? Actually, you know. Uh, we work with them, yeah, most of our vendors Aha, uh -huh. so yes, so do you know Vineet? No. So Vineet was, he was, uh, at the time when he was appointed CEO, he was a very young CEO, particularly for India, and he was appointed by one of the founders. So HCL was the technology company that actually started the computer business in India. And they ended up by 2005 being number five and about to become irrelevant, even though they founded the business. And we know we all worry about this kind of thing. And so he was asked by one of the founders to turn around HCL. And when you look at the turnaround, that visionary leadership you see very much in terms of the change process that they went through. What he tried to create at the end of it was a different kind of model of how they would think about leadership. And so Vineet, one of the, t these are his, maybe you know some of these people, I don't know, they may be a little older than this picture. But he said, looking at the demographics of India, what we need to be able to do is we have to turn over the growth of the company to these people. This is the future of the company. So we, at, in, in, as leaders, must recast our notion of what leadership is about. It can't be about setting direction and making sure people don't deviate from it, which is fundamentally what they had been taught leadership was about. And in India, again, pretty hierarchical, they needed to do something different. And he talked about, quote, inverting the pyramid. And this is one of their pictures. And what you're doing when you invert the pyramid is you unleash the power of the many by loosening the stranglehold of the few. And you know who the few are here. So many people did leave, but many people stayed. Other people came. It's a complicated process that they've gone through here to try to create a different way of thinking about leadership. But he said, we need to operate kind of like the Googles and the Pixars and the whatevers. And he visited those places with me. We introduced our, our leaders to each other. Um, again, no company is perfect, but these are the kinds of results that they obviously got from the shift. So they're real, they're financial. One of the things that happened over time in this organization in terms of trying to be more innovative is they've ended up, and this is what we're studying right now, they ended up figuring out a way of what they call business finance so they can show every individual employee who's working with a client how much money their work has actually, how, how much they've helped that client financially with what they're doing. That meant creating a very different way of keeping track of the finances to be able to do this. And each individual up on the website, it will tell them what has been your contribution to this particular client. Because what you're supposed to do now is go, quote, beyond the contract. You must meet the contract, which I need to do that, because otherwise we're not going to be hired again. That's what we're supposed to do. But if you don't go beyond the contract, this is beyond for this individual, then you haven't really added value to your customer. And that's what you need to do. So in part, without walking through all the pieces of the puzzle right now in terms of the culture shift and the change of leadership, this is what they've been driving toward. And indeed, they're still working on that. 
I'm going to stop right now. I'm going to skip this one as we, we've been talking about these ecosystems. You all can have all these slides. There's some questions for you to think about here about, you know, your, for your particular team, what's going on. What I want to do now is just um, end with this last piece about the leadership part of it because I think this is the part that's a really tricky one. And again, I don't think it's accidental that you maybe don't recognize Ed. Because what you do see about these leaders is that they understand that leadership is more about being the person who sets the stage and the person, as opposed to the person who performs on the stage. When you're really, really talented yourself, it is not easy to be the stage setter as opposed to the performer. And one of the real challenges you have, and actually Nelson Mandela talked a lot about this, is how do you create space for other people when you can take up all the space yourself? And that's really one of the dilemmas I think that many other leaders had. So I'd like to just end with that, that leadership thought and take your questions and we can go in any direction you'd like. Was that, did that give you an overview of what yeah. the basic story is? Yeah. Makes sense? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yes. So when you interview those uh, leaders, how uh -huh. do you actually um, decide is because their contribution to make the company more innovative or do they just happen to uh, inherit a, a good people and good environment? So I, I actually, this is terrible for me to say, but anyway, I, did, I attended the University of Chicago, so I do know about statistics. I am an ethnographer, and I have definitely sampled on the dependent variable, right? So I'm very aware of that, as opposed to doing the comparison. One of the things that I try to do is to study people over time. So as I described Luca, I've actually seen him in three or four different contexts over time. I can't prove it because I am an ethnographer, so I'll tell you that. So I would say that what we did to do this is we went through our... Um, if you will, Rolodexes in some ways, and said, introduce us to, we, we said, who are some of the leaders that everybody on, would say are really, really innovative, have created these organizations that have been very innovative, or ones that we see are trying to change. So when we met Vineet, it was when he first started to take over and try to change this company into an innovative company. The thing about Ed, which has been interesting, besides, you know, obviously they've survived, and I don't mean it in a negative way, but they've been acquired by Disney. When I met them, they weren't acquired. They've gone through a lot of change. He's also gone to Disney and been able to help turn around Disney animation. So I don't have proof, but I think that because we've looked at them over, we actually committed to collecting data for about 10 years just to see, right? And I think everything is complicated, so we still watch to see what's going on here. Right? But I, I can't, you know... I don't have the numbers for you in that sense. Yes, thank you. So a lot of your uh, information is about leading uh, from the top CEOs. Yes, so like, right. Um, I, I don't know how many CEOs are in yes. this room right now, mm -hmm. but I wonder, does the story change at all when you start talking about trying to show leadership from in the middle of an organization versus at the top? It, it, so quick answer. It, the process and what they're up to is the same. So one of the people we studied was a relatively middle, a middle manager um, in a, a company. I, I, this is a company that actually told us we could not write about them, the CEO either, because they don't pull out individuals because they have such a collective notion. This is a manufacturing company that you have many of their products. So the, in, in your home, I was really disappointed me that we couldn't write about them. But one of the things that I think happens a lot that we which is not so much a part of the story I just told you, which is the story in being the boss, is how you manage your network. So if you're in the middle, how you manage up and how you manage across is critical. It's true when you're at more senior as well, but that's a big piece of the story. So I must confess, when we wrote being the, being the boss, the second imperative of leadership is managing relationships with people over whom you have no formal authority, which actually these books don't completely gel this way, but that's a bigger they do that, and one person, her boss told you, you know, you're, you're, this is career ending for you if this doesn't work. But she thought, guess what, it, it's going to work. And if I do it your way, it's certainly not going to work because we're not going to innovate enough. But that managing up piece is critical. Okay. Is that, but the actual capabilities and the kind of culture, but they build a subculture because that subculture doesn't fit the culture around them. Managing that is, is really very tricky. Then, then the task at hand is actually to build your network and your local culture that can bring forth those three right. capabilities for innovation. And so, you have to find a way to make that work within the wider. Within the wider, if it's, a, it's, if, if it's the general counsel of uh, Pfizer, uh, she actually was building, her e was an ecosystem of the lawyers. They went, moved to something called the Pfizer Legal Alliance. 19 firms doing 75% of the work being paid a fixed cost instead of billable hours and trying to get those competitors to be in a community. That was one of the ecosystems we looked at. 
I mean, having to manage relationships with the whole company, she's pretty senior. The other parts of the company didn't want, you know, you pick the 19, not my favorite law firm that I like to work with, et cetera. So she also, it's not that even the very senior people don't have to manage the network, they do. I don't want to imply that, but for sure, you don't, you know, you're not the CEO, so you got to make sure, you got these other people who have to buy in. Thank you. Yes. So I have two things. One is um, someone online actually called out someone they consider to be an innovative leader in this room, and mm -hmm. Diane Wagner. I just oh. say that. I'm not sure she's still here. Okay. Because okay. he was hoping that she could actually speak to her experience at Microsoft of being an innovation leader. Um, and then the second question is, um, if you're not considered a visionary, yeah. how do you lead innovation? Well, I don't, if you're not considered a visionary, therefore no one will allow you to do it. I think you, what well, the person I'm talking about, another person that I, actually is not in this study. Let me go to a different person. But someone, I've actually studied, as I said, this has been a passion since day one. So the first case I ever wrote at the Harvard Business School, because I'm very intelligent, was about, <laughs> this, let me, this, you'll see what I mean by this, was a woman, about a woman named Suzanne DePass. And I don't know if you know who she is. But she was responsible for taking care of Michael Jackson. And so she was doing Motown 25 and helping him with the moonwalk. And that was the first research project I did. Because I figured if I'm going to be a professor, I may as well have fun, right? <laughs> so this is how. So my first case, I'm sitting next to Stevie Wonder and Smokey Robinson. And Eric Clapton comes in to play music with them. And I knew I had picked the right job, right? That's how smart I am. So ever since way back then, I've always studied people and worked and done consulting with people who work with really, really creative, innovative souls, right? So uh, that, that's, this has been a passion. So I, I, again, it's something I've actually been looking at in for, some form or fashion for a really long time. And I think in that context, I don't know, is Diane here? Yes, ah, oh, my friend back here. Yes, we were discussing, yes. So I think that you want to answer that? I, I'm not sure I heard the question. They want you to. Um, so you had a fan out in the out in the internet who said that that he considers you to be an absolute leader in this uh, in this model. So I think that that, that individual is a gentleman named Cristiano Suzuki. Hi, Cristiano. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, he's the one who directed me in a TED talk. Oh. Um, and we we, um, we tried to create the kind of environment that you described in terms of having not uh, leader led but uh, Group, a group culture where we could bring people together and that people were heard regardless of where they sat in the organization. I thought your question about how you manage in the, from the middle is quite relevant in that regard. It, it's not about who is the uh, person at the top of the org chart. It's about where are the ideas and how do you get people to come along with you and bring the ideas, have good ideas and then bring the, the organization along with them. Um, so I'm not sure if that's what Cristiano was well, I think, you know, the visionary piece, I was going to say, I, I got a little bit off, but I would say that when I mentioned the thing about Suzanne, I've actually, the reason I bring this up is I've always studied people who, who've been done very innovative or creative things or worked with very creative people and extreme. I'm actually very interested in how you work with extremely talented people because there's a theory that in, in my colleague who's two doors down from me writes about you don't want to have too many cooks in the kitchen, right? The problem, you only want to have... And I mean, Ed Catmull just laughs when he reads that. He's like, you've got to have a ton of cooks in the kitchen if you're trying to do breakthrough stuff. You have to learn how to get those cooks to cook together, right? That's the key. And how you carry yourself and behave is a part of getting them to do that. So one of the people I studied, going back I'm, this is before the study, was not considered a visionary, not a very good leader, or any of those things, and did this. And partly the problem is you don't stand out, necessarily. So she, and she said, you know what? It's going to work, and, and I'm going to get credit in the end. But you have to be comfortable with that. And people didn't recognize how visionary she actually was about a whole bunch of stuff. Her team did, but her bosses and, and others didn't. So I don't know that you know, they're, they're the usual suspect. And Mrs. Kim, most of her company is actually divorced women, or a large number of them, people work there who in Korea don't really have much standing. And again, people that you wouldn't see as being very innovative. I mean, a couple of, they, they have you know, Golden Week, you all probably know about. They have beat Prada and Louis Vuitton many weeks, this little company. In, in China with certain things. So I think that they're often, the last part of our book is called, about uh, invisibles, stylistic invisibles, demographic invisibles, and um, you know, where does talent, who has a slice of genius? I think that what you do see about these leaders is they're very generous in who they see as being able to contribute, frankly. But if you're not seen as a visionary, it is more complicated. You don't get those assignments, right? 
but you, if you do your work in a particular way, people see and are attracted to work with you. And her group grew over time, this one who wasn't seen that way and really ended up being quite, quite successful. Yes. So I'm quite interested in this notion of um, creative abrasion. Uh -huh. um, how is it that you that these leaders keep the abrasion and the discussions and the debate creative as opposed to just abrasive? Um, well, well, that's yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a very long answer. One of the things one goes back to the to be to you really do need to have the culture in part, right? So if you are in an environment where we do trust each other, what trust means in this model is. We assume everybody is well-intentioned. You just assume it. <laughs> now, if you could assume that, just imagine how much energy that releases, right? And if you behave in ways that you're not assuming that people are well-intentioned, someone, the boss is going to, the leader or boss is going to say to you, guess what, get with the program. Right? So, so that makes it much easier, right? If you assume everyone's well-intended. And, 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 and pull them up, pull people up, or comment, or help them or point out if they're not being well intended. Right. They, these I leaders, mean, one of the times they actually are most likely to intervene is when you violate one of the rules of engagement. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is if you, so that, but that's only, I mean, it's, it's not easy. The other thing is you've got to keep the abrasion alive, right? Because after you get to know each other really well, then you might not abrade as much. So one of the things, I'm, I'm just using Pixar in part because we know it a bit in some level, is they do, do know when you need to bring in new people when you actually need to mix in new people in that brain trust because you all become too alike in your thinking. So the leaders are very actively um, encouraging or even when I asked uh, Bill at Google what advice would you give to new leaders, he gave me two pieces of advice to give you. One is assume you're leading a volunteer organization. They are volunteers. Do not, do not kid yourself. People who are talented and passionate, if they're with you, they are volunteering, and you need to treat them accordingly. The second thing is remember that no one wants to follow you to the future. They want to co-create the future with you. It's very different, and then pay, pay. that's what you need to think about. And guess what? When you hire people, if they don't argue with you, don't hire them. You want someone who will argue with you on a job interview. And the final piece of advice he gets, gave was keep it uh, fuzzy. Sometimes you need to be vague and fuzzy. So one of the things that I know Vinit had a lot of trouble doing when he, he decided he didn't want to be vague and fuzzy, but he decided that he was answering too many questions. He, he became very transparent. There's a lot of transparency in these organizations to create trust. He, became, he had a you and I where you could write into the CEO and he would answer you. You all know the, that sort of thing. Finally, one day he said, you know what? I'm falling into the trap myself. So he now has something called my problems. These are the things that I didn't know how to do this week. Now, mind you, it's not that he's going to do everything you say when you write back to him, but this is what I had no idea about. What are your thoughts? And so at first, when they all got this, they're like, what do you mean? The, the CEO has something called my problems on the website? And he <laughs> sends those up. He said it was, it was his favorite email to do. Or it wasn't, you know, this, these are my problems. So, so, and, and so he had my problems, and then you and I, which were sort of yours. You know, and there's a whole set of rules about how those had to be answered, et cetera. But he said, I've fallen into the same trap myself. And obviously, we all have different levels of expertise, slices, et cetera, but let me, let me push this back on people. I have to tell you, it's as hard for, if you will, the followers to move into these ways as it is for the leaders sometimes, because it does require you taking on a lot of responsibility and accountability for your work. So there's a tug of war, I think, that can happen in this process. Yes, sir? Yeah, I'm interested in the third attribute that you talked about creative resolution. Uh -huh. Because that's the hardest, I feel, of the three <laughs> yes. in yes. general. Particularly in groups like Microsoft, with a lot of creative people that are doing the abrasion, creative abrasion is much more easy to create here. Yes. But resolution is the hardest because yes. one team will feel that they lost out and they either leave or go to some other group or go to some other company. Uh, can you give some more examples where it really worked and how, does, how do we really make it work? Well, it, it does really work. It is very difficult work. As I said, these, I think the thing that about it, and I, I'm not trying to avoid your question, is these are emotionally charged situations, which is what you all are talking about, because you actually care about it, right? It's not like something you want to give in on easily. That's, that's part of the challenge here. And I want to tell you, as I said, we've looked at many people, like Pentagram, I don't know how many people know Pentagram, is a very high-end right, design company. These are very talented people who talk about putting their soul on the line when they're designed, the man who designed the Harley Davidson um, Museum. You know, these are, he talked about what it feels like to be in a conflict with his colleagues about a decision that they're trying to make. I think the, why, what I've tried to figure out is leaders are more made than born. That's what the research tells us. 
But what is it about these leaders that allow them to be able to tolerate and absorb a lot of that negativity and make it still stay constructive when the rest of us would fall apart, right? Or not know what to do and, and amplify these differences. And I, I don't, I think there's partly, there is a bit of a constitution or something they've learned about it. You can get to the other side. And I, as I said, this culture is an important piece of it. What I guess we saw in these organizations is because they know it's usually a combination and they do more, I was spent a day with Roger Martin who said he's opposable thinking, right? So I'm trying to figure out how do you help people do opposable thinking and actually opposable decision making. I have to go spend another day with him. He told me he's going to show me the techniques they use. So then I'll give me an email. I'll send you what he, he sent, what I, what I learned. But I think what you see in that process is they don't assume that one group is supposed to win, right? So, and that the learning, the thing is that you cannot lose the work. If I've worked for two years on something, we cannot afford to lose that work. First off, it's just too valuable, the knowledge. And if you're in a place where you know that knowledge is still respected and is actually utilized, and frankly, you've gone through a discovery-driven learning process where you've seen the limitations yourself, right? No one else pointed them out to you. Bill didn't say, by the way, it doesn't work. You had a prototype and you tested it, and he's just asked you, well, how did it work here, there, and the other? There is an intellectual honesty that you come back to. And I, it, is, it, it, it does come together. I think to pull one piece of this out, it's very difficult for me to give this talk in some ways. It's tricky because it is about bringing those pieces together. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. But I, I, am, I really have, I did spend one day up in Toronto. I'm going back and I'm, going to, I'm very curious to see how you help people really work with opposable thinking more actively so I can give you a more precise answer. And if I'm on the website. If you email me about six months, I might have something to that I'm writing up about that seriously. Yep. Yes. Yep. Time for just one more. Okay. Yes. Sure. Well, I'll make it. A, I'll try to make it a long one. Though. Oh. Oh. Um, okay. <laughs> so, I've been trying to formulate this challenge. It, it, it seems as if the book is targeted at. Well, these are properties that companies that are innovative have in common. Mm -hmm. And yet most of those companies start with an initial spark. And, and I personally am fascinated where the spark comes from. But it seems this book is, once you have the spark, we'll help you kindle it and make it sustainable. For example, oh, okay. John Lasseter mm -hmm. um, at Disney, and right. maybe you could be argued Microsoft 2013, very similar to Disney 1983, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't creative aversion, that was just a version of right? Yeah, and it's when he got kicked out. Story. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Without mm -hmm. John, without following John Lasser, not that it's all him. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. It's this figurehead, right? I loved you saying visionaries influence change, but sustainable leaders for innovation. But most of this has the spark comes from when you're showing the Pixar map. Yeah. And it's 200 people, it takes them three years. But people like John Lasser originally, that's just his mind map. Because he was doing the shading and the modeling and the characters. And when the initial spark is first formed, so when people are reading your book because they're a company and they want to invest in innovation, but they yeah. don't have a spark, just creating that culture doesn't mean the spark is going to generate a priori. If the, the, I see the challenge. You, mm -hmm. that, that Where does it start? Challenge. Maybe going back to, yeah. so there are a couple things that I, I wouldn't claim to know more than I know. Just be clear, right? Because I, what I, I described, what, that's why I took the time to tell you how, we, how I do the data. I actually went, in fact, I was really, it was fun. Um, Eric, Eric Schmidt has a, um, a VC firm. So I went to speak to his portfolio managers, who are, these are new companies, right, about, what we saw here, and they, many of them were <laughs> struggling. Well, wait a minute, I'm the visionary, right? So we were talking about how, the, how they think about building their organizations over time. I think, as I said, all the people I studied are visionaries. They really are. I mean, they're, they're very, and, I, I, and they're very talented individuals. So I don't know that I haven't studied a situation where you haven't had that, and it's, you know, and I, because I haven't seen it, so I don't know the answer to your question. So Ed Catmull is the founder of Pixar, right? But the three of them, Steve Jobs, Ed, and John, they actually, as a collective, ran that organization for many years. And it was, they think it was very important that the three of them, it wasn't just a single individual who actually, but when you ask people, even though you just brought up John, you know, why is Pixar the way Pixar is, they tell you Ed. You mentioned John, right? So I just want to, it, it's an interesting sort of, yeah deal there. There's nothing particularly, and, and I think, he, I find Ed very charismatic, personally. I think, though, that most, you know, he's, most people probably wouldn't. Actually, number, I don't think you'd find Bill charismatic. So the notion of what these, how these people carry themselves and what they're like, they're not necessarily people you would notice. I, I, or in there, they're not in the, the model of the charismatic. I mean, Nelson Mandela is charismatic, but I don't know if you, 
But if you actually ask the people who were with him, there were many, many people who are more charismatic than him, they would tell you, right, who were in that movement. So, and I've been look so I don't know what to tell you, whether you can start it, but what I do see in these organizations is these people are always described as very demanding and very generous. And they're very generous people, so they assume that everybody has a slice of genius, right? So, so maybe That's a big next, assumption, right? Maybe a next book? Because I mean, it seems like you want like me to do, <laughs> what, what, <laughs> take a spark and blow what book do you want me to write? Oh. Oh. The Where does it come from in the first yeah, time? The, the, the abrasion, abrasion, the actual the, spark that then gets cultivated by these people into a system. As opposed to the, these people, okay. It's a collective act. I don't, I mean, some of them are, the, I do know the founder of HCL, Shiv, I did meet one of the founders, there were five of them. I studied eBay almost since its inception, and eBay Germany in particular is a piece that we wrote about. It's almost, they acquired it very early in its life and studied it over time. So I don't know, you know. I, I mean, an entrepreneur, you have to have that commitment to get that done, but I don't, I don't know. I see what you're asking, and I don't, the egg and chicken problem here, yeah. Oh, well, the last thing I will say, and then I have to let you go, is that actually a number of the leaders told me they learned to lead this way once they realize that lightning doesn't strike twice necessarily, right? So actually, Vineet said, I used to be command and control, et cetera, but when I understood that we needed to innovate time and again, it wasn't just about me, then I needed to change my mindset about leadership. So he learned it. Luca also described learning it, actually. I, would, I just said, and actually, there's a, one of the other leaders, Amy, described learning it. And she's a litigator, so believe me, right? So it's not a easy, but she gets it to the point that if you come to her house for dinner, she makes sure that she sits in the low power spot. Very, very aware of role modeling, exactly what needs to happen here. You know, but she's obviously a litigator who will take you to court and make sure she wins if she's in that courtroom. But when she's leading, behaves in a very different way. So learned it, right? Yeah. Yep. Yes. I need, to, I need to go. I'll stick around, but I need to let you all go. Can I take this last question quietly? Okay, thank you. Yes.